I would like to thank warmly the British School at Athens and all of the staff here who have made my period as visiting fellow such a profitable one. My lecture tonight draws on work that dates back several years and incorporates research that has been undertaken during many of my periods spent here in Athens. This work has benefited from many individual scholars, among whom I would like to mention thanks to Merle Langdon, Greg Stanton, John Trail and John Kemp. The work presented here has been made possible by the Epigraphical Museum and their academic adm and administrative staff and the first Epiria, <coughs> to whom I extend my thanks. My lecture tonight surveys boundaries. In particular, I focus on the inscribed boundaries of Athens and Attica. The majority of examples have been drawn from the less well-studied examples found in the Epigraphical Museum, and these will be used as illustrations for my lecture. But the purpose of this lecture is to demonstrate the complexity of what is still a relatively understudied set of material in its entirety. The work done on boundaries has focused on specific aspects, and what I will propose tonight is an example of how our understanding of space, or spatiality, a term I will explain later, can be expanded by considering boundaries as a whole, not only in their physical sense, but also in their intellectual sense, and in terms of how they inform behaviour within Athenian society. To demonstrate this argument, I have divided up my lecture into five sections. In section one, boundaries and their functions today and in antiquity, I'm going to introduce to you the kind of material that is available to us in all its diversity. In the second section, approaches to boundaries in ancient Greece, I'm going to summarise the kind of approaches and methodologies that have been used by scholars in the recent past. In section three, boundaries and the perceptions of space, I will demonstrate to you the kind of attitudes that the Athenians had towards boundaries and how they organised space and illustrate some of the evidence for those mentalities. In section four, I will introduce the term spatiality and, and I will demonstrate how I think we can use this approach to understand this holistic perspective of boundaries within the Athenian polis. The fifth and final section will be some brief conclusions. Boundaries are all around us, and here in Totsitsa Street in Athens, they take the form of permanent and semi-permanent markers of space. Here is one inscribed boundary, and in this photograph I prevent, present side A. <laughs> And in this photograph, what I will call side B. This inscription is epistographic, inscribed <laughs> on both sides. The people of Athens have inscribed their presence on both side A and here side B. But as you can see, this inscribed boundary displays secondary use and one assumes a different authority. <laughs> the secondary use has changed the nature of the boundary and at the same time provides us with important topographical information. Clearly in this space we can find a museum nearby. <laughs> 
the reuse has appropriated and transformed the original purpose of the boundary marker to serve a new function. There are many ifs and buts that we might consider if we are to imagine the future archaeologist or epigrapher. The paper, in hundreds of years' time, would have certainly fared badly. But the metal, the paint, perhaps it will have survived. Nevertheless, a future epigrapher is unlikely to fare as well as a contemporary scholar examining the stone inscribed boundaries of ancient Athens. Boundaries such as the one that we have just seen serve to define limits. They can reflect the voice of authorities and institutions. Boundaries can present a life story, a history of the boundary that we will need to be sensitive to. And boundaries can carry messages, instructions, warnings, exclusions, as well as information about the space that they define. And these are some of the themes, therefore, that will reappear this evening. Elsewhere in Athens, topographical space can be preserved in more permanent boundary form, locating here a stoa. whilst also presenting instructions and orders about access to space, the control of space. So having seen a few modern examples of boundaries, what can our examples from ancient Athens tell us about the boundaries of Athens and Attica? We start in rural Attica, where much has been said about the discovery of boundaries. And many boundaries discovered in recent decades are thought to have separated deans, as, for example, this series of rock-cut boundary inscriptions on the boundary or the hill between two ancient deans, Halai Aixonides and Anagirus, Vuliagmeni and Vari the ridge known as Caminia Ridge, indicated here on the lower, the lower photograph, and over here on the map. <coughs> These inscriptions cut on the flat bedrock are often difficult to find. Individual scholars following in the footsteps of examples like Eugene van der Poel and epitomised by the work of Professor Moore Langdon, among others, have been discovering rupestral inscriptions, boundaries, in the last three to four decades. Much has been said and much ink has been spilt about these rupestral inscriptions. Some have been removed over time. The development of the airport at Spata has affected one series from which one example has been preserved and set up on display in the airport museum. But the number of inscriptions increases steadily with time. More perhaps will be found in the future, others may be lost. But whether or not these inscriptions define deans is only one aspect of boundary culture. And I now turn to other categories of boundary inscription. The majority of inscriptions are preserved on stone that are set up for the purpose of carrying a boundary inscription, unlike the rupestral examples that we've just seen. Typically, such boundary inscriptions can provide important topographical information. This example here has been associated by many with the spring in the Asclepion, 
on the south slope of the Acropolis. This is an example that's preserved in the Epigraphical Museum. And it's part of a series that belongs to the better preserved example on the left-hand side of the photograph that's preserved probably in situ here on the south slopes of the Acropolis. Such topographical information can often, be can often be unparalleled. Here, an inscription is much less well presented and much less well executed than the previous pair. Contrast these well-cut inscriptions with this rough cut, roughly cut inscription. Here, the inscription has been punched the letters formed by punches of a chisel rather than cut carefully as in the previous examples. Boundary inscriptions take upon themselves different forms, different appearances. The execution of such inscriptions varies. This is something to which we will return later on. Unfortunately, more often than not, the inscriptions carry with them very little contextual detail, as the next two examples from cent central Athens demonstrate. Typically, we may know something about the fine spot, but often we have very little knowledge of any precise whereabouts of where the stone would have been set up. One of the questions we need to ask ourselves, often a question which we cannot answer, is whether or not a stone is a pierre arante, a stone that has wandered from its original setting up spot. Here, for instance, we have a boundary, but a boundary of what? Perhaps a burial, as indeed boundaries often mark out burials, or a sanctuary, but normally such markers include additional information, or a road, additional information perhaps usually being associated with such, with such inscriptions. Boundaries therefore bring with them topographical uncertainties. And that makes it difficult sometimes to treat in detail the specific elements of specific boundary inscriptions. Here is another inscription from the same context that carries additional information that defies an easy explanation with an alpha inscribed on the second line after the four letters of the word boundary. Perhaps one of the most frequent forms of a boundary are the boundary inscriptions marking out burials. These are numerous and often not particularly well inscribed, as the example here, nor necessarily inscribed on well-finished pieces of stone. Again, as you can see here, this is a stone that's very roughly cut and the letters are fairly roughly inscribed. In this example here, a stone of another purpose has been reused to mark out the boundary of a burial. In this particular example, the dimensions of the burial plot are given, 20 feet within and 30 at the sides. But note again the kind of inscription, the kind of stone that's being used, and the, and the rather casual appearance of the lettering. Typically, the burial plot is not defined, dimensions are not given, and the context is often lacking, which makes analysis very difficult. The size of boundary inscriptions varies incredibly. And note here this example, which is only about 20 centimetres in width. Boundary inscriptions can be small stones, bearing little monumental presence, but could easily be missed. So they vary enormously in quality, execution, nature of the material, 
and size of the stone. As we saw in the first example from Totsitsa Street, boundaries can be opistographic, raising questions about their presentation and display. Here, for instance, is one side of an opistographic stele. The tailed row of Horos on one side, and here the different letter forms on the second side, indicating the boundary as defining a burial plot. Note again here the relatively small size of the stone. These may not have been easily noticed. If burials are marked by boundaries, so too roads are also commonly marked out. Here are two examples from the recent emergency excavations in the Mesoyeya. Roads themselves often serve to describe and define plots of land. And so it is important that their limits can be reinforced by inscribed boundary markers. Encroachment of space was a major issue, and the preservation of the integrity of roads and burials was clearly a major concern for those interested in controlling space in Athens and Attica. Perhaps one of the most obvious needs to control space in was the need to define <coughs> sacred space, such as that associated with a sanctuary, as on this example here. Sacred space was not to be polluted, and so the polluted were not to enter a space defined as sacred. The classic example of this instance is, of course, in Thucydides' description of Athens in the early years of the Peloponnesian War, Book 2, 16 to 17, where the occupation of the sacred area around the Acropolis was commented upon by Thucydides as people crowded into the city and took up habitation wherever they could, towers in the city, where, city walls, or wherever else people could find the space. In addition to sacred space, boundaries reveal to us information about the institutions of the city, as here we see a plot that seems to belong to the deemsman of Piraeus, an inscription where we can have a slightly improved reading of the previous text. In addition to deems, treaties are also marked out, not illustrated here, and bring with them all kinds of interpretive problems. Other institutions have their space marked out. Property here concerning a fratry and many other subdivisions of the city-state are illustrated by boundary inscriptions. One other major category that ought to be noticed are the boundary markers that mark property and indicate their financial status. Such inscriptions serve as security markers. And here, for instance, is an example found in the recent emergency excavations conducted by the Archaeological Service, marking out a property. These form one of the most significant categories of boundary inscriptions. They indicate property, not only immovable, but sometimes movable. Such stones could relate to houses, workshops, but also slaves. Property clearly had a major importance for the Athenians. And what's interesting about this category is how it informs not only institutional behaviour, but also the economy, the functions and actions of social groups and the role of individuals within the polis. I've presented to you a brief survey of the kind of epigraphical material that exists amongst the category of boundary inscriptions. And now briefly I want to outline how various scholars have approached boundaries 
and in particular focus on the aspects of boundaries that I'm interested in this evening. What I'm not going to talk about are boundaries as state frontiers. This is a long-standing topic on which Daverio Rocchi has published a book in 1988. More specifically, the boundaries of Athens and Attica have attracted a great deal of attention. The Ephibic, the Ephibic Oath, for instance, indicates how Ephibes were to swear and swear their oath and call upon witnesses, including the boundaries of the Patris, referred to by both Lycurgus and an inscription. The boundaries of Athens and Attica were defended and have been explored in two important works by Josh Oberg and Mark Mon. And the sacred Orgas has received a great deal of attention, the boundary marking the space between Athens and Megara in the Elysian Plain. See most recently Papasacardis' book, Appendix 1. In addition, de Polignac's controversial work in which cult sites have been argued as ways of defining polis space is also not to be explored here. And we should bear in mind that also Athens in the imperial period was also exporting boundaries, exporting boundaries to Egina, as for instance Polinskaya, and indeed others have discussed. These are things then I'm not looking at. What I want to move away from is the more fragmented and specific kind of analysis that has occupied academics in recent years. When boundaries within the polis are considered, those boundaries are focused on in certain ways. A whole series of studies have been focused on deem boundaries, as I've referred to already. See, for instance, Trails, Demos and Tritis, and now, in a very useful survey, Ilaria Bultragini's unpublished PhD thesis, which surveys the epigraphical evidence for deemed boundaries in southern Attica. Tritis markers I've referred to. Financial horoi, which mark the security and financial encumberment of land, was originally studied by Moses Finlay, now revised by Millet. And see most recently a useful survey article by Edward Harris, whom I thank for sending me a copy of this piece. Boundaries, as we've seen, are also used to mark out burial areas. And it's worth considering now the most recent study on periboloi tombs in Attica by Daniela Marciandi. And it's worth bearing in mind that boundaries also can be seen acting symbolically or semiotically. The city wall did or didn't serve as a boundary, according to some scholars, and an excellent article in Hesperia has surveyed this. And a recent monograph, I forgot to put the reference here, by an Italian scholar on roads in Attica has also appeared in recent years. Typical among the approaches to boundaries within the polis are various dualities, public and private, city and countryside, sacred and to some extent secular, polluted and unpolluted. What I'd like to do is to move away from these specific approaches and take a more holistic view. One scholar in particular has pioneered that more holistic view, and that's Gary Lalonde, who is in the audience tonight. His excellent treatment of boundaries found in the Agora excavations within Agora 19 serves as the best survey of boundaries available to us and I owe a great deal to this work. But in addition, Gary Lalonde has also demonstrated how specific case studies can serve us very well. For instance, in his analysis of the deems of Milite and Kolitos in central Athens, which build upon his observations on the boundary inscriptions IG1 cubed 1005 A and B. 
and in his book-length study of the Athenian shrine and cult of Zeus, Horos Dios, located on the Italian plan recently published on the left-hand side, and focusing on the two inscriptions which I was able to see with Robert Pitt, thanks to the first Ephoria recently, on the right-hand side of this image. What's fascinating about these inscriptions, both rupestral and both extremely well-preserved, is of course their early date, as you can see clearly from the three bar sigmas, tail row and use of the aspirated a micron, but also in the lower example, the retrograde version of the Horos Dios inscription with the interpunct and three bar sigmas again quite prominent. To move away, therefore, from these specific studies, it's worth bearing in mind what Athenian perceptions of space and Athenian treatments of boundaries look like. And so in this third section, I just want to review some evidence for Athenian mentalities, for Athenian perceptions of space, and how some of those mentalities get played out in the classical period. It's worth bearing in mind that not all boundaries are inscribed. And so, famously in Homer's Iliad, when fighting Ares, Athena sees with her strong hand a stone that lay upon the plain, black and jagged and great, that men of former days had set up to be a boundary marker of a field. And with this, she struck Ares on the neck and set loose his limbs. Not all boundary markers were inscribed. And so I'm aware, by concentrating on inscribed markers, that I am potentially neglecting certain amounts of evidence. And here at Ramnus, uninscribed boundary markers have indeed been found by the archaeological eteria in the theatral area. And in this illustration, the three uninscribed boundary markers are illustrated. So indeed, we do have uninscribed boundary markers in certain areas. What were those mentalities? How did the Athenians approach boundaries? Perhaps most famously, the Asinomoi were responsible for various aspects of civic organisation. In the Athenaeum Politeia 50.1, we're told that they keep watch to prevent anyone from depositing ordure within a mile and a quarter of the city wall, and they prevent the construction of buildings encroaching on and balconies overhanging the roads. And we've seen shortly before the importance of roads and boundaries of roads and burials, and burials would often encroach on roads. So we can see the, the importance of roads, and here an indication of the Astinomois function other Athenian officials were also involved in the oversight of boundaries. The king archon, the Basileus, is to define sacred boundaries for the sanctuary and the Pelagicon, according to IG 1Q78. A more detailed inscription from the 5th century described how the king archon was involved in the lease of the land associated with the sanctuary of Codrus, and here we're told that the Haristi are to define the boundaries of the sacred space in lines 6 to 8 of the inscription. In the plan on the left-hand side, you can see an indication of the sanctuary site and also the location of one of the boundary markers of the sacred space that has been preserved. In Attica... Boundary marking was continuing, and in the 4th century, in the Deme of Sunion, a new agora was produced for the Demesmen. Three men are chosen with Lucius to define the limits of the Deme. No one is allowed to build within the boundaries of the agora, according to this inscription found in the hills of Lavrion, north of the Temple of Sunion, IG2 squared, 1180. 
economic transactions, as we've already seen, were used to define boundaries and describe and prescribe financial operations. Financial space was a very important part of the operation of boundaries and the central aspect of the mentalities that the Athenians and perhaps the Greeks in general had towards space. In Plato's laws, we're told here too that boundaries serve an important function. No man shall move boundary marks of land, whether they be those of a neighbour who is a native citizen or of a, for or a foreigner. Sooner let a man try to move the largest rock, which is not a boundary mark, than a small stone, which forms a boundary. No one shall voluntarily move the boundary marks of the land of neighbours. Whosoever encroaches on his neighbour's ground, overstepping the boundaries, shall pay for the damage. It's worth noting here, having seen the examples in the first section of the lecture, that even small boundary stones shouldn't be moved. And this coincides with the kind of evidence we've seen for the small size of the boundary markers. Boundaries, therefore, served a wide variety of form and function. Research has focused on specific aspects of boundariness, of boundary mentality of boundary practice. Boundaries clearly served and were of fundamental importance for the organisation of space in Athenian society. But how are, to we, how are we to express and discuss this wide-ranging operation? What language, what vocabulary are we to use to explore this topic? Given that current approaches often fragment our focus and move away from a holistic appreciation of boundary and space, what way forward can we use? And in the final section of my talk, I turn now to the concepts of space and spatiality. Henri Lefebvre writing in the post-war period, was an influential Marxist thinker whose production of space has been of great influence. In French scholarship, space, l'espace, has become a very banal term that's used and banded around rather indiscriminately. But behind the use of that term, there is a long, strong, theoretical tradition which has influenced French scholarship. And therefore it's to French scholarship that those exploring spatiality owe a considerable debt. Lefebvre's production of space argued that all social space is the result of a process in many forms and movements, both perceived and real life, practical and theoretical. And the important point here is the social nature of space, something that obviously allows us to roll up all those different fragmented aspects of space that the study of boundary inscriptions has already demonstrated. Neither nature, climate and location, nor earlier history are sufficient to explain a social space, says Lefebvre. Such a space contains very diverse elements, natural, social, networks and channels, carriers of material and information exchange. It cannot be reduced to these elements that it contains, nor to their sum. And it's interesting in current scholarship how many of these terms are now in themselves subjects of study. Networks, for instance, is a, an important aspect of understanding. 
ancient society. Neither nature nor earlier history are sufficient to explain a social space. Location alone, topography alone, is not sufficient. What one needs to do is to combine different approaches. The natural, the social, the networks, the ties that the use of space brings together. And the use of space allows us to understand how information is transferred. Lefebvre's work was heavily influential on a postmodern geographer, Edward Sojar, who devised the term spatiality, a term that he uses to move on from Lefebvre's work. And in this series of essays, Postmodern Geographies, now in its second edition, published last year, Sojar demonstrates how one can advance our understanding of spatiality. Space should not be seen only as the reflective mirror or the embracing container of social life. Spatiality is socially produced, a term directly taken from the fervour. And like society itself, it exists in both substantial forms, concrete spatialities, boundary inscriptions if you like, and as a set of relations between individuals and groups, an embodiment and medium of social life itself. What's fascinating here is how Sojar moves on from Lefebvre. Lefebvre was interested, as a Marxist, in the group definition, on the social definition of space. What's useful about Sojar's development is his, is his interest in the individual. And of course, in Athens, where individual burials and the marking out of the property of individuals, individuals are of great importance for us. And individuals need to be understood alongside groups. Groups and individuals is a key element in our understanding of how Athenian society worked and is, and is being used to define our own specific approach to the ancient economy at the University of Liverpool. Spatiality can therefore overcome the dualism of physical space versus cognitive space. Spatiality requires us, therefore, to consider how we integrate social, physical and cognitive space. How we understand and combine the mental mentalities, the intellectual, ideological attitudes towards space, the evidence for the physical organisation of space, and the social histories and the social complexities that can be explored through analysing space. In what remains, therefore, I'm just going to illustrate a few with a few examples some ways in which we might start to advance our understanding of boundaries in this holistic way by using a spatiality approach. Sorry, I've lost the slide there, haven't I? In this first example, we see, as in our first illustration from Totsitsa Street, how inscriptions can be used and reused. This text, published in Inscriptio Nesgrachiae, IG2 square 2558, presents on the right hand side a text in which we're told a rasura occurs, an erasure. Recent restudy of this inscription, however, reveals that this erasure illustrates clearly the second use of this boundary stone of a burial. Although the fragmentary letters of the first use of the inscription can't clearly be made out, and I've separated them out on the left-hand side, and they're integrated in the right-hand side, <coughs> 
you can see clearly the traces of an earlier inscription. The spatiality approach, if you like, might allow us to explore the changing attitudes and changing mentalities towards space. The fact that space can be defined and redefined, that material culture can be used and reused here in this burial enclosure. The reuse of material provides us with an interesting insight into the continuities and changes in the use of space in Athens and Attica. Burial markers are one example where we can see this happening. And here is another. An inscription of an imperial period marking out a boundary, Oros. What's interesting about this inscription, however, is that it appears on a funerary monument. On the left-hand side is a funerary monument, and on the right-hand side, the inscription that occurs on the top of the monument here. Unfortunately, I've not been able to study the erased text that you can see here in the photograph. The inscription hasn't been moved out from the shelves in the, in the Epigraphical Museum. Careful study of the erasure may reveal some traces of letter, but the essence is here that we have a Hellenistic or early imperial inscription whose function has changed completely from being the burial marker of an individual and now has been turned into a marker of space. Another indication of the changing nature of space in Athens and Attica. A third example is more complex and potentially more interesting. When going through the series of inscriptiones graecae uh, boundary inscriptions, this one jumped out as an interesting example to look at. It's not an inscription that has been studied as far as I know since it was published originally by Kierkegaard. This inscription of the imperial period interestingly carries information from an earlier time. The inscription is inscribed on the top of the circular monument with the word koinos and then on the external face of the truncated column we have in large letters the word oros you can see some of that here with the inscription going around the circumference of the cylinder to the back of this image here. The inscription reads, the boundary was set up in the archonship of Leocaris, an archon who dates to 228-227 in the late 3rd century. Leostratus, son of Demetides of the Dean Pellini, from the limit of the road, and we assume a word here, probably Feru says, that carries to the something. And then on the back side of the column, we have the word parontone with the following present, with a name and other names perhaps that would have existed on the lower element of the column. Unfortunately, it's not clear what function this inscription served. It's tempting to suggest that this marked a funerary enclosure, and indeed, by looking at the fine spot of the inscription, which Kirchner identifies as being in the royal stables, we can make comparisons with other inscriptions found in the area. The work of Yorgi Amalaku has gathered together much material 
of an epigraphical nature that's been found in this part of Athens. The royal stables were located within the roads of Odos Panapistimiu, Americis, Dadiu, and Vucurestiu. Many archaeological and epigraphical remains have been found in this area, including many tombs. And it's worth noting that in this location, a 5th century set of inscriptions was found, perhaps marking out a tomb, and they're illustrated here in, this three, in these three images. This is IG1 cubed 1100, representing three separate inscriptions. The series is presented here, all of which present a very similar form and are well executed. And after the word oros, we have a single letter, kappa. Adding to the series of inscriptions that provide additional information in the form of letters, single letters or double letters, after the word oros, about which we can't really be certain as to their significance and meaning. Perhaps the location, therefore, in the royal stables, allows us to argue from this example and from several others, and indeed from the confirmation of this area as an area for burial, as demonstrated by the recent Syntagma metro, metro excavations, that our inscription here perhaps was associated with a burial. Another interesting example of how change and continuity in space and in physical space over time existed can be found on the financial inscriptions, the security markers. And here is an example from the Agora, an inscription that has been cut not once but twice. A property was sold and then later resold. When resold, it was resold to the Eranistai, and the older, te older text preserved, was preserved, and new elements were added the identity of the purchasers and the new amount for the property. This inscription nicely indicates the continuity of the inscription how it was used and reused in the space with which it was associated. Whether or not the inscription refers to the same property is, however, and unfortunately, less clear. In terms of changes and continuities, one of the most interesting developments in Athenian history was how land could fall under the care and attention of people and be subject to abuses by individuals. In the long Hellenistic period, a great deal of social change took place in Athens and land and property seems to have changed hands frequently and perhaps have been used by individuals in ways which contravened old usage of land and property. At least that's the impression that we get from the important inscription from the Augustan period of Athens, IG2 squared 1035, shown at the bottom of this slide, which refers to individuals occupying areas that were sacred. In the early imperial period, this inscription informs us that there was a considerable reassessment of land in Athens and Attica. And it's to this period that some have been tempted to associate 
some of the more imperial looking material from the history of the boundaries of Athens and Attica. One such example are the inscriptions from the hill Alapavuni, seen here in the centre of the photograph, um, beyond the Hilton Hotel, a photograph taken a few years ago. And on that hill, Mer Langdon and several others found a series of inscriptions in which the word oros was supplemented by letters below and above the four-letter word oros. The letter forms have been associated with this imperial period. And it's been suggested that these may also have been marking out land that came under the changes introduced by the Augustan reforms. By approaching the material from the spatial perspective, we're therefore more inclined to amass the holistic evidence of boundaries and use that evidence to allow us to understand the Athenian attitudes towards boundaries, their use of boundaries and the way in which boundaryness changed over time. Boundaries can be classified effectively as a genre of material and are therefore worth studying collectively and holistically. They take on different forms and different appearances, as we can see in this photograph here. Some inscriptions are on very roughly cut pieces of stone. Some are on very roughly cut markers designed to be buried into the earth by the pointed end here. Other inscriptions are poorly inscribed on pieces of marble that were to hand, as in this example here. And others were simply very small inscriptions, an illustration that we've already seen. It's unusual to treat these inscriptions together as a genre, as a whole. And the only example that exists has been the long study of the Agora material. What's needed, therefore, is a study of this category of material that embraces not only the city centre, the material from the Agora, but also the city as a whole, the material from the Epigraphical Museum, and, of course, the extensive material from the Attic countryside, including not only the rupestral inscriptions, but also the more movable monuments that have survived. <coughs> the spatial approach towards this genre of material, I think, is one way that we can use to move the discourse forward, to change our paradigms, to change our approaches to the way in which we treat boundaries and the way in which we appro approach Athenian organisation of space. What I've tried to do is to outline the nature of the fragmented approaches that have been adopted towards boundaries. Specific questions have been asked of boundaries, focusing on very individual themes. Specific studies have, been taken pla have taken place, some of which lay great stress on the importance of different topographies. There are limits for the, to the debate on the Dean border problem. Not all of these boundaries found in the Attic countryside, on, rock, on rocks and pestle inscriptions, not all of these can be Dean borders. There is therefore something of a two-dimensionality towards these traditional dualities of public-private, polluted-unpolluted city countryside. And I think, indeed, the city countryside is a real red herring. Therefore, what I would propose is a more holistic view of treating Athenian space. 
which combines an approach that embraces the mentalities towards space, the actual study of physical space, and all the elements of social space that go with a complete analysis of the institution, institutions and individuals that one can associate with the use of boundaries. What benefits do we have from viewing spatiality in the Athenian polis in this way? This will allow us to integrate the multiple forms of evidence and all the subcategories that have typically been associated with these fragmented approaches towards boundaries. This approach will allow us to look at boundaries as an expression of Athenian cognitive behaviour. And this is of particular importance for all kinds of um, follow-up understanding of Athenian society. For by understanding Athenian mentalities and how they approach their spatial organisation, their economic and institutional and political behaviour can also be understood. These are therefore, I think, and what I'd like to propose as, the benefits of an approach towards boundaries within the Athenian polis, which combine both spatiality and epigraphy. And it's worth bearing in mind that boundaries will be lost and can be difficult to be found, can be difficult to find. And if you're ever interested in taking a machete up to the Capitos and cutting back this plant here, you will find one of a pair of boundary inscriptions that is, I think, the nearest boundary inscription to the British school. And it was formed as part of a pair. The other one was located on this hill here, Fuchsmal, indicated in this map here. Unfortunately, anybody who walks over towards the French school from the British school and crosses over part of this hill will realise from this photograph that half of that hill is no longer there, and presumably that's the half of the hill on which the other boundary inscription that formed a pair with the one on the Cavitos existed. Boundary inscriptions are all around us. Boundary inscriptions can be lost. Unfortunately, they can be found. If we treat them as a whole, I hope, and I think, we will understand much more about Athenian society. Thank you.